Hi, my name is Tracy Lynn, and welcome back to Hold the Granola, a no bullshit pod about yoga, fitness, and dance that features students, teachers, and movers making their way in these problematic industries. In this episode, we will do a deep dive into shadow work as dancers, with important topics including decolonizing language in belly dance and defining the self outside of our teachers. My guest today is Satin. Satin is a fusion dancer based in Bordeaux, France. Aesthetically, Satin is inspired by the gracefulness and sensuality of Manat dances, but also by the boldness and high energy of house dance and dance hall. We unpacked her live performance and most recent protest for the Black Lives Matter movement. My friends, please welcome Satin. Hello, Satine. Hello. How are you doing? I'm great. And you? I am well, thank you. Thank you again for coming on to Hold the Granola. It's been a couple weeks since I've done any recording, and I thought it would be so timely to speak to you about all the amazing topics that we have conjured up for our conversation today. I'm really glad to be with you today. Thank you so much again for inviting me. I am super excited to have this conversation with you today. And yes, we've been talking about this for a few weeks. And we are here today on the first or second day of Scorpio season. I mean, couldn't be a better time for all the things we have to say today? I don't think so. (laughs) I couldn't agree more. And that's why I wasn't too keen on being super hard on scheduling it right away. Um, Because yes, it is Scorpio season. This is shadow season. and, And I know that we definitely wanted to talk about dance and performance arts and the way that these are very therapeutic and bring out our shadow and they're very transmutive and they're very therapeutic. And I was like, I just, I was watching you perform. uh, God, it's probably been actually a couple months now. (laughs) It was like a special lockdown show. Yes. Yeah. And this was like right at the peak of where globally Black Lives Matter was was in full effect and you exactly. did a pe- yeah you did this amazing piece that was this amazing tandem and and co-effort of activism and performance and that's when I really thought like I want to know you more I want to speak to you more and that's what really motivated this oh thank you this gathering (laughs) so tell me so tell me about yourself tell me about where you're from where you're tuning in from today and we'll go from there uh where i'm from uh i was born and raised in dijon the capital of burgundy uh i've been living there for like 24 years and i moved to Bordeaux like nine years ago Mm. because i fell in love with, with this city so Bolo is so beautiful. I just fell in love. I didn't travel that much when I was younger. And I felt like I needed to see something new, experience something new. And yeah, just living my own experience on my own. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, oh, this is beautiful around here. I'm going to stay, <laughs> literally. <laughs> and yeah, um, uh, so I'm here in Bordeaux. It was kind of difficult at the first because I didn't have anybody around. I moved with my best friend and he left like six months after we arrived because he couldn't find a job. So I was just like on my own and I mm-hmm. it was, a little bit terrifying at first because you know when you when you go to school you get to know a lot of people and mm-hmm. you know you socialize very easily but when you when you work it's not the same so it was very difficult at the beginning and people in Bordeaux are known to be you know um not very open-minded they stay in small groups and okay. don't go 
out of this a lot. Um, so it was good. Well, not that easy at the beginning, but day after day, I've built my own network that is constantly mm. moving because I'm doing a lot of things and see people from different areas and perspectives. So that now that's fine. I'm feeling good in this city and I do things that I that are exciting. I dance a lot. I meet lots of <laughs> different gender. And yeah, uh, I just uh, I just love this area of France because I'm close to the ocean. I'm close to the mountain. I'm close to Spain, even though I can travel at the moment. But mm -hmm. still, um, it's a it's it's a nice place to live. I kind of enjoy it. Yeah, um, I I wouldn't mind being on lockdown in France right now. I would really enjoy that. <laughs> and we we there's no curfew in Bordeaux. Um, a lot of cities in France have curfew since one week, I think. And mm. it's not the case yet for Bordeaux, but I feel mm. like in two weeks we'll have it because everybody's coming here for vacation and yeah. it's going to be screwed <laughs> in two weeks, I suppose. <laughs> but anyway. Yeah. That's that's the that's the thing. The big difference between the European response to coronavirus and the United States response to coronavirus. <laughs> we never really had a curfew. The only time we had curfews is when protests were popping off and people were like, Oh, we're gonna beat the shit out of you unless you're in your house by eleven o'clock. And <laughs> that's why this um country is literally a dumpster fire right now. So <laughs> that's crazy that's really crazy i just can't imagine how the the, the climate is in the u.s but there's so much going on police brutality the president that's doing so many dumb things i'm like oh my god <laughs> oh the the orange overlord yeah yeah <laughs> The man is insane, Satine. He's insane. He got coronavirus, as I'm sure you saw. Yeah. But Everybody laughed a lot about this. I, oh, I God, I'm sure we're so entertaining to Europe. Or is it like watching an episode of Keeping Up with the Kardashians? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> This is like a train wreck in slow motion. I can't peel my eyes away from the screen. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, so you are in Bordeaux right now. You are from Dijon. <laughs> cute i love that i am trying oh my god i studied french in college and of course i didn't keep up with it so the only thing i can do is give my 75 percent best effort at pronouncing french words and cities and names <laughs> you're, you're doing great keep going thank you <laughs> <laughs> and please correct me at any time um so let's get on to the dance topic because that's what I really wanted to jump into. You're really my first dancer that I'm interviewing that is within the community where I dance or at least the style that I dance. So we're talking about Menat dance, which is Middle Eastern, North African, Hellenic, and Turkish. So that's like the grouping of styles that we're talking about because we're realizing now as we're trying to decolonize our language that we're not going to say tribal fusion. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I can't stand the word tribal anymore. In France, it's not really as evolved as in the US right now and people are still using it, mm. but everybody has his own pace. So that's okay. But to me, when I hear that, when I'm like, what? Do you just give him a slap? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, dec decolonizing the dance and the vocabulary is so important. So I'm glad to, to see that you're doing this effort and a lot of dancers in the US are doing this effort. So 
thank you and keep going. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm trying my hardest to decolonize everything because everything I do is not mine. <laughs> yeah. I'm a yoga teacher. Um, I am a dancer that creates fusion pieces that take from Minot styles and from African styles. And I'm just like, holy fucking shit, I better tread carefully right now, <laughs> you know? And it's it's just, it's very important to do this, you know? I, yeah, you know, it is. It definitely is. And I, yeah. as soon as you're conscious about all this, mm. about all of this story, it's okay. You're ready to fumble forward. We all are. So that's fine. Yeah. So what is your dance background? Tell me about that. Starting from the, from the very beginning times. <laughs> uh, the very, very beginning time. Um, I think I was like 14. Yeah, I think I was 14 when I took a dance class for the first time. And it was more than jazz mm. because I kept watching videos on MTV at the time, it was music television. Yes. At the time, there were like music videos all day. Oh, it was so good. Take me back. Oh, <laughs> take me back to the time. Absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, um, I just wanted to, to act like the same people I saw on TV because it was so entertaining and so funky and so cool. So I took a modern jazz dance class. Uh, it only lasted a year because the teacher moved to another place and it was too far away from my home and too expensive. So I stopped. Um, uh, then the second experience I had about dance was uh, a few years after that. It was in junior uh, in high school, the very last year before I got graduation. I got into contemporary dance mm. and it was absolutely amazing. A whole new world was opening in front of me. Mm. So many things about the floor, about new music influence. I grew up listening to pop most mm -hmm. of the time and music from Africa as my father was a uh, bass guitar player and he had a couple of records at home and there's this image I keep having in my head is him playing guitar me around the records he has and I think I got my passion from for music at that time mm. and yeah um, I was listening to a lot of pop music in the 90s and everything and going to this contemporary dance class made me discover electronic music. Mm -hmm. And it was my very first connection to an artist that is close to my heart, which is Pure. And at that time we performed two, two of her songs mm -hmm. and it definitely changed my life. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, um, I got this class with a teacher that was going to be an official teacher. And she was telling us so many things about life, about being a young woman. And it was really special. I understand now how special that moment was and how it put the very first foundations of the dancer I am today. Mm -hmm. uh, the second foundations that were established in my dance experience were in, in university, I followed uh, a dance class that was a folk dance class about Israel in the Middle East. Hmm. And uh, when I saw that, I was like, mm, what is that? Let's try. Mm -hmm. And it was all dances in circles. You hold hands and it's all about foot patterns. So lively. So um you know the feeling when you you are with people you like and you know a lot and it's like a warm thing mm -hmm. you're in this together you it's simple steps you can follow along quite um quite easily and it, it felt so good so i kept on going to these classes and the teacher told me 
if I wanted to be in the dance troupe that is out of this class? And I was like, yeah, definitely. I love so, that. <laughs> uh, so I came to, to, this, to this group and I stayed there for six years. The, the group is called La Luna del Oriente. It's still mm. going today. And it's everything to me. I learned so much in that troupe. Mm. We did so many amazing things. Um, there was a, a whole show about uh, the feminine and the plurality. We worked with uh, a Mena troupe and the Fomenko troupe, and we mixed. I was already in fusion at that time. I didn't know oh, that, wow. but it was already fusion. Yeah. Uh, so we worked on this project for like two years. Um, I also experienced for the first time working with musicians. Mm -hmm. uh, we got connected to a group of people, an association in Dijon that promotes local artists. And there were several musicians from different groups that joined together. Um, we met them, they listened to the songs we were performing to, and they reinterpreted the, the, these songs, and mm. we performed with them. So it was, it was completely awesome just to listen to a song that you, you keep on listening because you, you're working on it, yeah. and realizing that other people can interpret this. So it was just like crazy. Was it, uh, uh, was it um, improvised, the dance form? Was it improvised or was it choreographed? Uh, it was choreographed. We, we learned those dances and we, we changed, you know, the, 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 the setting on stage and we even changed the steps just to bring something more, um, more performance friendly. Yeah. Because all of these dances are, you know, in circles and you hold hands and everything. So we just wanted to um, put them on stage and be creative. Mm -hmm. So it was, so when talking about the, the Octarian moment with the musicians, so it was that group of musicians that reinterpreted the songs we danced to. And we also created choreographies on songs of another musician. His name is Gonkari. I will remember this guy forever because he's amazing. Um, and we, we, the feeling was so strong with that guy. I think we worked together for like three years. It was just so great. And it was the very first time that we created choreographies. With um, the with musicians. Our, Yes, with, yeah. with this musician, this particular musician. And he composed the tracks with us. Mm. We, we used to tell him what we felt about the draft of a song, why, what, what elements we would like to hear so mm. that we can emphasize it with movements. And he did it. It, it, was, That's it so was amazing. Amazing, and I also got the chance to travel a bit. Uh, Dijon has a partnership with a city in Germany. It's called Mayence. It's Mainz, I think. And um, every year, people from Dijon are going to Mayence, and people from Germany come to Dijon. Mm. And one year, we the our troop uh, traveled, and we performed there. We also. Uh, performed a lot in the south of France, in the city of moustier sainte marie because um, the, the, the boyfriend of my teacher at that time has his house, had his house in mm. his town. He still is, uh, in fact. So every, every, it was between spring and summer, we went there, we performed. It was a really small town. It's a really small town. And it was really a particular moment for us. Mm. Uh, so, so many mo memories are popping up in my head as I'm talking. Yeah. Moustier saint marie is a very beautiful place near the Gorges du Verdon. Google that if you like. God, uh, <laughs> you just tell me how to spell it and I'm there in the Google yeah. search bar. I, I, I'll tell you. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> 
um, be, being in La Luna de Loyan Zipov, all of those years was was very special. And it was the very first time when I got to experience how good it is to be in a group. And we were getting along so well with the girls. We had, we were going through a lot of, um, you know, difficult moments together, you know, like breakups and, you know, oh, stories yeah. like that. Um, and we we supported each other a lot. And since we, we were so close, when we performed together, something special was emerging. Yeah. And people kept on telling that. They, they, they saw how special it was to perform, not only for the audience, but for us also. Yes. Because being in that group, creating that environment and experience, was truly something special, and I never forget that. Mm -hmm. Never. It when was really you, special. Yes, like when you have this. There's, I think, there's certain magical things that happen when you have this convergence of artists. Because to me, dancers are artists, and to borrow even from Martha Graham, kind of like the mother of modern dance, um, that dancers are the athletes of God they are tapping into something that is divine. Like we are divine yeah. conduits as dancers and what we bring out is light. It is darkness. And so, yeah, it completely makes sense that people were telling you, Hey, what you have here is something very special. And I completely, I really miss that. I really miss that community yeah. that you're talking about. Right. And even in the circular dances with, folkloric dance like there's just something that you create and conjure when you're with a group absolutely absolutely oh. so mm -hmm. this ended in like 2011 and then I moved to Bordeaux so I just left so many things and um, it was really painful to leave that group mm -hmm. really really painful I think I I didn't do anything for a year after I moved here. Everything lost sense. I kept on I kept on partying. I went to the club every weekend. That was amazing also, but something <laughs> was missing. Yeah. And then I got into uh, a dance class, uh, a fat chance by dance format. And that's how I got into fusion. Mm -hmm. uh, in Bordeaux, there were two teachers that were doing so um, fusion dance and fat chance belly dance format. So I took both classes for a year, and then I stuck to fusion. And yeah, it was a, a very brand new way to be in my body, to mm -hmm. uh, be aware of my humidity uh i got to connect with a new group of women uh creating a new uh experience with them it was great mm. it was great i learned so many things and i think everything changed when i went to italy in 2016 tell me about that uh, it was the tribal rumor festival in Viareggio yeah, in Italy and I got the chance to be in the pro track group that was directed by Rachel Bryce mm -hmm. and I was like oh okay. the first yeah the first fusion dancer I ever saw was Rachel and she is some otherworldly serpentine creature from another planet <laughs> <laughs> and and my teacher Angelique is a is a teacher of Rachel and she admires her for so long so meeting her meeting the person who has taught me so much was really important to me and I just got into a group of professional dancers and I was like mm -hmm, okay I'm the little baby in the room but hi <laughs> I 
remember because um, it was kind of particular. Because I missed the first day because that year my sister got married and it was like a huge, huge celebration. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I couldn't take the plane on Sunday to be in Italy on Monday. I just had to do the whole thing. And so I missed the first day. So I felt like I really missed something because the first day is really important to me. Oh, yeah. Uh, because you got to know everybody and everything is starting and everything. So I was like, oh, sorry, I missed the first day. Hi, this is me. Hi, hi, hi. So I got I jumped into everything like crazy with mm. all the energy I have on a regular basis. Doing my best because the level was quite high. Yeah. And I didn't expect it to be that high. So I was like, woo! Mm-hmm. it was fine it was really fine people were super gentle super um yeah and that's how I got to connect with dancers like Gudrun Herold like Charles Toussel and I met other French dancers like Luna um but it was really a, a step forward in my in my dance experience because I was among a lot of dancers that had the level I want to reach still today. And Mm -hmm. it was just the challenge I needed because I'm a girl that loves challenge. I just need to to be kicked in the butt sometimes. Uh, So being among so many talented dancers made me think that I had no choice but being the best version best version of myself and being my boundaries a little bit further and it was it was great I I had classes with so many so many teachers that I admired for so long and Mm -hmm. being able to talk with them and experience their classes and Receiving that knowledge felt absolutely yeah because I, for so long I've been sorry I was just thinking like it's it's so good to not be the best dancer in the room. Like when you're around yeah. people that have this this level of skill, it's like you're going to naturally need to evolve closer to their level because they're going to be the ones asking that of you. And so, yeah, when you're in the room with, you know, people like Rachel Bryce and you're like, oh, my God, <laughs> you know, like that's a recipe for evolution. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I keep on um, being surrounded with that kind of people because I feel like this is the only way, as you said, uh, is the only way to to go further. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I was saying that uh, being on this group for this whole week made me realize that I have the ability. And for so long, I kept on saying to myself that I did not have that ability. I I was so harsh on myself for so long. And then having this experience, as I'm looking at it now, I'm so grateful, mm-hmm. really. And um, it, it changed so many things about how I see dance with a big D, a capital D, as um, it changes a lot about what I saw about myself and it really raised the bar, but in the positive way. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm forever grateful of this opportunity I had and I connected with so many good people. And that's the first time also I saw Alexis Alho. I've been watching her so many times and I mm-hmm. saw her on the train going back to France. I was like, hey, hello. And I was so impressed. Like, oh, she's here. Oh, my God. Oh. Hello. <laughs> hello. It was all of it because I, I had lessons with 
Margie Love, Kristen Adams, Kate, Kate Montgomery, uh, Ashley Lopez, Amy Sigil, so many superstars. And every time I was like, oh my God, she's here. Oh my God, hi, 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 hi. <laughs> But yeah, it felt so good. And going back to, to France after this amazing experience made me think that I had to travel to study, meet people that inspire me. And that's how I got to be outside of France to study. And after that, I, um, I went to the UK to meet Alexis Selfo and participating into her Juniper project. Mm. Uh, that felt super great because, I don't know, Alexis has really something special. Yes. I just love her dance first. And I just love how humble she is. How she she makes things so easy. I don't know if I'm just connected to her in some ways, but being around her, being around her feels so good because things are easy and fluid and natural it feels naturally to work when i'm with her yeah. everything is so clear so not effortless because i'm challenged also when i work with her but i don't know and uh, being on the juniper project was really special also because i didn't know anybody except google mm-hmm. um and I I don't know if she had dancer from France before me. I don't think so. But yeah, it was like maybe like the the, the precedent experience I had in Italy, me going alone into a place where I know anybody, but here to create something that is um that is beautiful that has worth creating art simply Mm -hmm. and yeah it was also something special to be around dancers that I didn't know but we had that uh, choreography that we all learned and we gathered when we can to put things together and create something that we could share on the stage and this concept is really it's really great yeah it felt really good and I did that also two years after. It was last year, 2019. And it was even, it was another experience because it wasn't the same people, it wasn't the same choreography. Um, but I, I just love being around Alexis. And I'm a big fan of her work. She's a great choreographer. I just love her perspective. Mm-hmm. I just love her vocabulary her influence her music taste also i'm really in love with this person in addition so, in addition to alexa southhall who are some of the dancers that you take your biggest inspiration from movement wise um there's also the the okidasi company i didn't talk about this experience i was about to but mm. i'll do it now yeah uh, perfect I, segue yeah <laughs> absolutely <laughs> i went to portugal two years ago in 2018 for the okidasi dance intensive i did the first love so it's the week uh, a whole week where you study all the influences of the troupe mm-hmm. so you have um house dance capoeira voguing whacking and fusion and mm-hmm. you mix everything at the end you're like immersed in the um the um, shit how i say that um <laughs> you work as the as the group is working concerning creation and everything you're emerged in the in just like in the group you you get they, they give so much those ladies give so so much and it was also another groundbreaking experience for me because I reconnected with things that I had experienced before, like contemporary 
like hip hop, mm. but some things were really challenging. Like the capoeira class was so difficult for me. <laughs> That's one of the craziest thing that I love about that collective. I'll just call them a collective is that fusion of it's like, okay, we're doing dance martial arts, the whacking and the voguing. So these kind of subculture, or at least I just think of the movie Paris is Burning. I love that movie and how it's like this ballroom culture. Like that is such an amazing fusion. And that with the Minot stuff, it's like. Yes. And the, their the, fusion is like, no, their <clears throat> fusion is like no other. And they, they, they share so much, like everything they have, they share that, they share that with us at that time. And yeah, though, so the Archidarcy Collective is, is a huge influence for me. I fell in love with Vogue and Waking thanks to them. So I thank them for that, for mm -hmm. making me aware of this dance form. Um, Camille Lowe is another dancer that I really love. Um, Ebony is another dancer I really love. Sadira is another dancer that I really love. Um, when you when I get outside of this little community, um, dancers like um, Mart Van Gel, like Sart Akimi, who are dancer dancers. Mm. Uh, Daphne Bianchi also is a dancer dancer that I really love. Um, yeah, at the moment I'm really influenced by uh, dancehall because I take a few classes. I've been taking classes like for a year, not regular ones, but workshops on a regular basis, like every two months or something like that. Um, I got back into house dance as well. I've been spending all summer having outdoor trainings with local dancers. It felt so good. <laughs> it felt so good. I, I felt the need to go further in my dance, being closer to the dancer I really want to be. Um, in fusion, what the limit that I saw and got conscious about is that there's something really rigid in the posture that mm. starts to bother me a little. So that's why I needed to be more like, let the energy flow in the body in the more, um, how could I say that? Um, with more flow, maybe. Like more uh, Yes, yes. We were fluidity, maybe. And I also felt the need to go further concerning my footwork. Um, so, yeah, that's why I decided to put the emphasis on house dance and on dance hall because I feel connected to... No, I mean, I have some sensation when I practice those styles that I don't have when I do fusion. Mm -hmm. And I just want to put all of those things together. I know it's going to take some time because I'm just starting the process right now. But I don't know, I have this little thing inside. When I'm having a dance hall class, I'm just you know in my thing and I know it feels good mm -hmm. but I also like to do insulations and uh chest isolations and everything um so yeah I'll I'll do something I'll cook something with all of this I'm, I'm already doing that you're already doing it yeah yes it's, it's a process I know that the I have to stir the pot and yep. it will take a moment but it's it's happening and that leads perfectly to what my next question was going to be, because I know it's very difficult to find your own voice in dance, especially when you feel, you know, so heavily influenced by a certain teacher or certain artists. Like, 
I have a lot of friends that did, you know, the fat chance style. And you see fat chance, even if they do other fusion things, like you'll see the fat chance in everything they do, or people that are, um, you know, students of Zoe Jakes or students of Rachel Bryce, like you'll see Zoe in them and you'll see Rachel in them. And I'm not saying that this is a bad thing, but it is a process to finding your own voice and dance. And all of these people found you know, they found their style and they found the way that they're able to communicate what they need to communicate when they are on stage or off stage, right? So for yourself, I mean, you kind of were answering it there, but how, how are you actively finding your own voice as you're, and I know you feel like you're just now sinking your teeth into this. So that's why I think we (laughs) timed this interview perfectly. (laughs) (laughs) Because um, this is it, right? It's like you have to be the student and then you, ugh, like, so please tell me, how are you uh, finding your own voice? Um, I didn't have a particular plan because this question I've been asking myself for quite some time now. I think like maybe after going to Viajo. Probably after having this intensive with Rachel Bryce. Um, before going deeper on that topic, I just wanted to, to mention something. Um, when I started Fusion Dance, I had trouble to identify myself as mm-hmm. being a legitimate member of this community because I didn't see any dancers that look like me. Everybody mm. wanted to look like Rachel Bryce. I, I just love her, obviously, because she's just amazing and she brought so many things into the community we all are today. Mm-hmm. But I couldn't see any brown dancers or any mm. one or two of them. So it was really difficult to me to, you know, have um, um, a start containing costumes and everything because I didn't see anybody that looked like me. Mm. So when I when I discovered Ebony, I was like, oh my God! Yes! I can do that also! I can wear an afro and have a dance costume. That's okay. And it changed everything. Mm. I think it was 2016 yeah, or 17, I can't remember, but it wasn't that far. I started the fusion dance in 2012. I've waited like four or five years to find somebody that looked like me. Mm. That's huge. And now I have brown dancers all over the place and I'm so happy. But yeah, <laughs> um, it, 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 I, I, I think I started to find my own voice at that time because mm. I just saw someone that looks like me and she didn't do anything special, but she's just being her. And I love that. Ebony, if you listen to it, I love you. Um, but yeah, seeing her made me think that, yeah, I can do it too. So that's probably how I got into finding my own voice. Mm-hmm. And um, it's not an easy thing. And I didn't have a plan that was rolled out on my feet. Absolutely not. Um, But to me, finding my own voice was just listening to the little voice behind my head that kept on saying, Sarah, stick to what feels good to you. Yeah. And uh, right now, having a dance class feels good. Because I love the music, I can vibe, I can undulate with all of my body if I want, mm-hmm. and that's okay. Uh, dancing on house dance feels good. Um, so yeah, I just go back to things that feel good to me. I think that's how you you are the most genuine. Yes. Um, Authentic. Yes. I um I, I do not I do not think that there's 
uh, a unique answer to that question, but the most essential part to me is to connect to things that feel good. Because when it feels good, you don't have any, you know, boundaries concerning creativity because it just feels good. So it flows. Yeah. So, yeah, you have, maybe you'll have to search for one, two, three things, maybe obviously fail, obviously. Of course. Because it's part of the process, right? Yes. But yeah, uh, I'm still finding. Well, and I think, and I think that that answer will continue to change. As you Absolutely. evolve, right? As you evolve as a human being, as a woman. I mean, I'm just thinking of when I started dance when I was 18 to now that I'm in my 30s. It is night and day <laughs> in terms of what I'm pulling inspiration from and what I'm trying to emote on stage and what feels good on stage are com- two completely different things. And I think that that takes a lot of work, um, not only in the dance room, but emotionally and spiritually, because again, we are these conduits, like dance is an emotional thing. We are, Absolutely. Driven, right? We are driven emotionally when we're performing. And so, yes, the things that brought up emotions before are very different now. So that leads me into my next question for you. <laughs> I'm just trying to move it along here because I don't want to keep you on the phone forever because it is late at night there for you. <laughs> and I know you just um, got off work. <laughs> that's completely fine. My evening is all yours. So we just we can just keep on talking. That's okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but our, our kind of original thing that we were dancing around was um, doing shadow work in dance. And I know shadow work feels a little amorphous and it is definitely in its essence a little bit strange, but I think it's important to do shadow work as a dancer. And to me, shadow work is looking at the things that perhaps you don't want to look at or the things that are holding you down, the things that are binding you, preventing you from actually being your most authentic self. So for you, the shadow work in your dance form, I would love to hear about that piece that I saw you doing where you were holding up signs. You were dancing to one of my favorite groups, Krong Ben. I love them I so, love so much. <laughs> and I was like, I, I was like, look at this joyful creature it was just authenticity is just the word that I saw so <laughs> I would just love to hear about that piece if you have words on it oh I can tell you the story around that no problem um first this was all in pro um I performed this piece for for Alexis a show, uh, an online show, the second one she did in June. It was the, the 6th of June. I remember that date because it was, as you said earlier, the moment around the world where protests were going on a lot. The peak about the Black Lives Movement was on and the death of George Floyd in France resonated with a case that is going on for four years now about the death of Adam Atrale. Um So a lot of protests were going on. There was a protest in Bordeaux that day. I couldn't be there because I was having dance workshops all day with Alexis and Ebony and Emily and other wonderful teachers. So I decided to protest in my own way and participate in that movement in the ways that I could. Um, So that's why I had those signs. I built them the the few hours before performing. (laughs) Uh, It was a a, a last minute idea that I had. 
because I had to do something. I had a couple of friends that planned to go to this protest and I couldn't be with them. Hmm. And I was pretty pissed about that. But I was also super happy to have a day of dance because it was a moment that was quite difficult in my personal life for other reasons. Uh, so spending a day dancing was the best solution for me to feel better at that moment. And having those signs was my way to protest and hear my voice and uh, speak louder about what was happening at that moment. Mm -hmm. And those signs were in French because they were addressed to French people. And the funny thing is that <laughs> the, the most resonance that this performance had was overseas. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I really wanted to, to, to alert people, mm -hmm. French speaking people that were in my network about about this topic because we we need and we still need people to stand up and speak about the real issues so um yeah that's pretty much what i wanted to do on that day and since i couldn't be in the streets and raise my fist and say loud that black lives matter i did it on the screen and with the tools that I have, that is my body and movement and how I react to the music that I love. I simply did all the things that I could with the tools that I had. I think it was, to me, it was a really tiny, tiny contribution to what was going on in, in the country. But I, I was really happy to do it. And... I really wanted uh, to let those people aware about what was going on at that moment and my French speaking friends to encourage my French speaking friends to stand up and speak loud about these topics. But I didn't put any true expectations. I just wanted to amplify those voices mm -hmm. with the humble tools that I had. Well, I think <laughs> I don't think that was a small contribution. I think that was a massive contribution. Thank you. Because witnessing a black woman dance with joy, that I mean that in itself is is a protest and is a is a massive movement. I mean you you let us in. And we were speaking earlier before this about what it is like to be seen as a dancer and as a performer and the importance of that and that exchange and that relationship between audience and performer is something that is, it's hard to describe and it's, it's hard to put words to it. So now as we are in this digital age and we're not just in a theater or in an outside venue performing for a small amount of people, we're performing for the globe. We're performing in a way that we never really have before. And so what you did was, was massive. And, and thank you for, for doing that. No, oh, thank you. Oh, um, um, oh. Thank you so much for your words. It's really going deep within. And yeah, I just I just wanted to 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 do things in, in the ways that I could. And yeah, I I just don't feel that feel that it's it's huge. I think I never will, but that's fine. Um, I'm just trying. I'm just trying. And I'll keep trying as much as I can. I'll try. 
I promise. Well, I love watching you dance and I hope you continue exploring dance and sharing it with us because... Uh, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> at the moment, I'm not dancing that much because I'm injured. Mm -hmm. um, but I hope to be able to share my love for movement soon. I hope. Because uh, at the moment, my body is not ready. Mm. Because I've been experiencing challenging things recently. And I had a lot of trauma stored in my body. Mm. And I need to heal for the moment. So I'm still... Enthuse, enthusiast about dance, even though fusion dance doesn't inspire me as much as it used to. I know I'll keep going in that way, but maybe in another form. Just you know, processing the 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 thing that I'll find my voice, as we said earlier. At the moment, I'm more inspired in other dance forms, the dance forms I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I still love doing Mayas and snake arms. That's fine. <laughs> of but, course. Yeah, at, at the moment, I'm just a little bit shut down because, yeah. because, because I need to heal. But I think I'm, I'll never stop sharing art with the world because that's how I feel alive and that's how life makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. If I do not dance, I die, literally. Yeah. And even though I'm injured at the moment, I still, you know, noodle a little when I listen to a song. I try to be cool because I don't want to hurt myself more than I'm hurting at the moment, but Movement is just part of me. It's just a language that I use to just exist in the world. I cannot find any ways that are more efficient than movement to exist in the world right now. Yeah. And I think it will be for the rest of my life. There's another quote that you just brought up for me when you are saying that and it's another Martha Graham quote <laughs> 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 of course but she was um she says that a dancer dies twice once when they stop dancing and this first death is the more painful one <laughs> damn it Martha <laughs> I feel this so much. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry if I'm poking emotion buttons. Oh, that's fine. But I that's but fine. I feel that so much. I feel like even at the beginning of quarantine, um, because I felt so uninspired. Also, I didn't feel inspired to move. Even doing yoga was very difficult for me. Um and so, yeah, to come back and and be re inspired by dancing, when, like whenever whenever it comes back to you is the right time. And as much as I think there is space yeah. for movement, right, there is space to not move. You know, you don't necessarily have to have these massive lateral movements for this to be considered uh, dance, because dance is always within us. And I'm still a person, right? Driving down the highway and I hear a song and I'm choreographing something in my brain. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I'm always doing that. Please. Never stop. Never. Never. I have a, I have a whole Spotify playlist with songs that I love mm -hmm. and I would like to dance to. And then I maybe... 
150 songs at the moment that each of them have a section in which I want to create something. That's ridiculous. So see, there's still so much time for you to dance. So if Absolutely. you need a little rest right now, you take it. <laughs> you you just said something that I really felt also when you said like sometimes you don't need to dance. Sometimes it's needed just to rest in order to be able to move. Yeah, it's, it just makes so much sense. So it's it's the same for talking. You don't have to keep talking all the time. You can just remain silent for a moment mm -hmm. and maybe acknowledge what's in your head. And if you speak, you speak words that matter and that have sense. And mm -hmm. I think it's the same for the body, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I just want to thank you for taking time out of your evening to speak with me and to share your story and to share your inspiration. And I would love for people that are watching or listening to be able to find you on social media. So in what ways can the world find you on these <laughs> um, platforms? You, you can follow me on Instagram. I think it's the platform in which I'm the most active. It's a teen dancer. I have the same username on Facebook also, but if you want to be like updated about what I'm doing at the moment, I think you should follow me on Instagram. Follow me on Facebook also, but Instagram is the most active platform I'm in at the moment. Great. I'll have all of that linked below. Um, and again, just thank you. I'm just giving you this giant virtual hug. And I thank I just, you so much. I love watching you, witnessing you. And again, thank you for taking time to speak with me today. Th thank you so much for inviting me again. And I went pretty deep today and I felt comfortable to do it with you. And it's not every people. So thank you for allowing me to be that honest and that raw. <laughs> it's not really the, um, the thing that I... Uh, expose um, but today I felt really comfortable sharing stories about my life and sharing thoughts that I pretty deep I didn't go into details but I was just comfortable saying things for from the bottom of my heart so thank you for that thank you I love you. I love you. I love you. And as, they, love you. <laughs> as they say in France, or as they do, bisous, kisses, yes. three times, grand bisou. Merci Merci à toi. And I can't wait I to speak you. to you again. I love you too. We'll talk I again. Love you. Soon, no problem. <laughs>